Welcome to Law Officer Live. My name is Travis Yates. I'm the editor-in-chief of LawOfficer.com. It is July 5th, 2017. Hopefully you all still have your fingers after the festivities of last night. Hopefully everybody had a great time celebrating the greatest country on the planet and we're so glad you're with us today. You're going to love today's episode. We're going to talk a little bit about police leadership, community policing, training, policy. This is a high octane episode with none other than Chief Mike Carter who has of course been here before one of our most popular episodes on leadership. Check that out later if you want to see a phenomenal dialogue on what police leadership needs to look like. And later on today we're going to talk about his latest police plan and a lot of leadership stuff. But before we get to that we are so thankful for today's sponsor which is Safe Tac Training. SafeTac Training has a course called Courageous Leadership that you've probably heard at on this show before. Stacy Tell is a lead trainer in that, in that training environment. And this, this, this training has gone across the country, particularly Oregon, California, West Coast, believe it or not, has been very, very popular. It's soon to be in Los Angeles. It's going to be in Northern Oklahoma a little bit later. Texas, Washington, D.C. area, lots of venues coming up. We want you to check out what this Courageous Leadership class is all about. It is unique, none other than I've ever seen before. I was recently in Milwaukee with Stacy, and the feedback is incredible. So we're very thankful that SafeTac is sponsoring this episode of Law Officer Live on leadership, and in particularly the Courageous Leadership Seminar. And our guest today actually makes an appearance via video in that seminar, Courageous Leadership, so we're very thankful for them. Now I'm with Chief Mike Carter, a 24-year veteran of law enforcement. Of course, you've seen Mike on Law Officer Live before. Several months ago, he was on the show, and it was one of the best episodes we've ever had where we focused entirely on police leadership. We're very honored to have you back again, sir. How are you doing? Well, thanks for having me. Now, Mike, I, I just kind of want to take our audience back to that episode that months ago. They can obviously search that on lawofficer.com. Just type in leadership and Mike Carter. Excellent episode. I've actually, I'm, I'm just going to tell myself, I've watched it a few times myself because it's just one of those things that I keep hearing some of these things that we talked about, and it just, it just makes total sense. I just kind of want to take our audience back and kind of you kind of circle back on kind of what your philosophy of law enforcement leadership is. Well, number one, it's for your people. It is giving them the best environment, the best working environment so they can go out and do those great things they do. If you, um, you don't have to micromanage, you don't have to worry about those details, you need to give them the best environment and they, if you inspire them through your leadership, they're going to go out and do things way beyond even right. your capabilities and, and so it's, it's providing that environment. It's good stuff, man. The fact that the Courageous Leadership Seminar that it sponsors this episode, we, we actually talk about you and some of the things that you've done. I love talking about some of the things you've done. This latest thing you've done is while you're on the show, you came out with a policing plan for your agency. And I, we're going to get into what that is and what is inside that and why we both believe that every law enforcement agency should have one. But just sort of tell us the genesis of how this began and what made you as a chief decide that you need a plan for your community and for your department? Well, let, let's start with this premise, and this might be a little controversial to say, but law enforcement agencies do a terrible, terrible job about telling the public the truth and about what we do. Uh, we are reactive. Mm -hmm. We always, When a crisis happens, we're backpedaling and we're trying to answer questions. We let the media dictate the context and we, the facts. Yeah, and a, a we lot set of, back and don't say much. Absolutely, a lot of people, the media, uh, citizens, people who are upset, and it's always reactive and let's start doing things ahead and let's start telling people who we are. Let's stake our ground. That's the second point. Stake your ground mm -hmm. and tell people what we do right and set your standards now because if there's going to be a community conversation about what your policies are or about what your philosophies are or what you believe in as an agency, yep. let's have it before there's an yep. incident and not after there's an incident because everything you do after an incident yeah. is going to be reactive and if you set the groundwork before something happens, it is much better to stand with that standard during that incident than to try to uh, be reactive. One of the Courageous Leadership Seminar we actually talk about deposits and withdrawals in our community. And the deposit is what you're just talking about. This document right here is a huge deposit into your community where you're saying, this is who we are, this is what our plan is, this is what we will do. And that way when something happens, and maybe the communities, you gotta kinda make a withdrawal from that deposit, you're not going bankrupt because you've already told them exactly what you're doing. 
Right, and because you've involved the, the community with what your planning is, you've already got the buy-in from, from people, from the stakeholders. You've already included them, and so it's no longer the police department did this. It is the community with you made right. this plan, and they've, they've okayed it. And the other thing is, is we always couch things in terms of um, political parties and political philosophy, mm -hmm. liberal versus conservative, and let's start thinking about things in terms of right and wrong. Let's get people's buy-in. Let's do those things. When I was a young officer, the buzzword was what? Community policing. Community policing. And we all thought community policing was DARE or other well, programs. The Dancing Bear, which you'll explain yeah, later. Yeah, the yeah. Dancing Bear, all those types of things. And we don't, you know, and so it turned people off of that term. We have the newest generation of that. We have procedural justice. We have de-escalation training. We have these things, and you have young officers out there rolling their eyes going, Chief, I'm out here in the real world. I'm handling calls. But what we've understood since then, or what I've understood since then, is, is that there's truth in community policing. There's truth in doing the right thing, and there's truth involving the community. Because when you do that, it pays dividends when you have that negative event, right. when you have that thing that happens. And we're going to have tragedies. Our job in law enforcement is to go where there's pro when there's trouble. Yep. We go find problems. Yep. You can't go find problems and not think that there's not going to be use of force and, right. and other things that happen. But you, the, the payoff that you have for involving people beforehand is, is you have those discussions and you get their buy-in. Well, you said something that I think scares away a lot of agencies when we talk about getting the citizens involved because we hear these nightmare stories about citizens review boards and citizens disciplining officers. We're going to get into that a little bit because you have a little bit of that in your plan. Absolutely. But I want to know how you got your citizens involved. This is a very extensive plan. You can go to, like people can go to lawster.com right now, type in Sand Springs Police Plan on the search engine. You're going to get the article where we actually list this document and your citizens are intricately involved throughout it. I just kind of want to get your, you know, kind of ask you, how did you get citizens involved and how did you get buy-in from them? Well, we invited people from the community. And uh, one of the things that you'll see in the plan, and it's a controversial thing in law enforcement, is we invite members of our community. We selected them because we thought they were good, solid people, not because they were necessarily just pro-law enforcement. Yep. Or we, we selected people that we thought were good people yep. who had a good head on their shoulders, and now they are my advocates. They go set yep. in on our use of force reviews. They sit in on our complaint reviews. And the, but the biggest thing, we gave them training. Yep. So they went in educated about what police officers do and about why we do those things. Good stuff. They've heard things like Graham versus Connor, beforehand not after the event and yeah. so when they look at it they look at it through the eyes of what would a reasonable police officer do in a similar circumstance and, they're ed you've educated and we've educated yeah. them that being said the public now has their eyes and ears in there to show that we don't cover things up police officers know we're not covering things right. up we know there's 750,000 law enforcement officers in the United States and that daily they're handling millions of calls for service. And almost service. all of it's on cell phone camera. There's yeah. nothing to cover up the, anymore. The, yeah. We know they're out there doing good work, but we let the narrative be that it's a constant cover up, that there's these bad things going on. So if you stake your ground with a policing plan and you put it right out there for people, you're saying this is what we believe and you have those conversations ahead of time. It's good stuff. I love that you getting the citizens involved. Now, and I keep I hate coming back to courageous leadership class because, but it just, I mean, you're, you're doing it. We actually have a section on what you talked about getting citizens involved. And here's what the section's called. It's called reformers, activists, and cop haters. And this is what we tell people in class. And I think you just nailed it. Uh, activists, they're not going to pick up. They're, other than picking up a sign and screaming, they don't really want to do much. Cop haters, they're going to call your name in 30 seconds. They really don't want to do much. But the reformers, every chief should identify the reformers in their community, the people that want to help police, people that want to help police improve, get better, more professional, and get them involved. That's what you've done. You have found the people in your community who want to actually help your department become better. And you use them, right? Right, right. We, we put them in there, and uh, they're, uh, we have a pastor. Uh, for, you know, from church carries that credibility with mm -hmm. the community. We have uh, minorities. We have uh, the cross average, section of the community. Cross section. Yep. We have everybody on that, and but we've given them the training, and we know that they're in there for the right reasons. And if we're wrong, we're going to say we're wrong. What about your officers? Was there any backlash from your officers when they? Because you know, obviously, 
the negative connotation is because it has been used poorly in the past when you get citizens involved. Sure. I, there's a the correct way to do it, which the seminar talks about, which you are actually doing. You get the right people involved and you train them and you help them help you become better. Uh, how did you sell this to your department? Uh, that's, that's one thing, and I want to make it clear. In leadership, you shouldn't have to sell things to people. If you set a culture of standards and you set a culture of doing the right thing, mm -hmm. my guys are out here doing the courageous things. My right. guys are out here doing the great things. It's not Mike Carter. Yeah, that's, that's another another section of the class is you're not the hero. No. Your officers are the heroes. They are the heroes. That's they, right. And that is not something, I will tell you that privately, I've told you that privately, it is not me, and it is easy to look great when you have such great people great, with yeah. you. And that's, a, that's something that we've, we're going to face in law enforcement. As, it's get, as the negative press is out there, as the pay is low, as the other things, we're finding it harder to attract good people to this profession. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be more incumbent that we set those standards and we keep those standards because if you lose that credibility with the public, it's a compounding problem. Right. And so we have to keep those people coming in that are good. And the best way to do that is to treat your people right and to do what's right by them because then they're gonna do what's right by the community. That's good stuff. Now I'm gonna go line by line on some of this section. So, uh, you know, I, you're gonna to wanna to talk about a lot of it. We're gonna to try to get through as much as we can, but I was infatuated by the section on tickets, citations versus warnings. You made it a go that your primary job is safety. And that doesn't necessarily mean writing more tickets to people. Kind of explain that in your plan. Yeah, I, when we started this out, we started this after Ferguson, and every law enforcement officer that, that saw the Ferguson shooting said that was a justified shooting. I, I, don't, I didn't talk to anybody that had right. any questions about that because we understand Graham versus Connor. We understand those things. But I wanted to see what the DOJ report said, and there's some troubling things in there. Right, you know, about we, the department itself. About the department yeah. itself and about the way they were using uh, traffic stops to generate revenue. We've never had that in my community. We've never had that problem, but we wanted to stake our ground. Again, I told you we have terrible job telling people what we do right and stake your ground. Right. We did our we stuck our ground on the fact that we're not revenue generators. We're not going to be out there doing that. When the finance department says uh, we're 23% down in citation revenue, it bounces right off of us because that's not what we're out there to do. That's right. We look at collision statistics and are we are where we need to affect those safety things, but we're not concerned about whether revenue's up or down. And the feedback from your citizens has got to be positive for that, right? Yes. And the key also is the uh, support that you, that you get from the city. My yeah. city said, we're going to do the right thing. And Good that's stuff. what we wanted to do. You cited the 21st century policing plan that President Obama's regime did. That thing immediately got a negative, negative connotation because of some of the things that President Obama's administration did to law enforcement. But as we've said here oftentimes here on lawofficer.com is, that document is a pretty good document. There's some prof there's some things in there that you kind of shake your head at, but I would say two-thirds of that document are really, really good for people to look at. And you, of course, cite that document a lot in your policing plan. Kind of talk to us about your thoughts behind that. A absolutely. And, I, again, w I don't ever approach something from a political spectrum and right. say this is – and I also know that there were police officers on that task force. I know that there were police officers that I know that were on that. Well, Ramsey course. headed it up, and he's a very, you know, he's very well respected within law enforcement. Uh, Charles uh, Ramsey, I think, yeah. the Philadelphia, former Philadelphia commissioner. So, so I knew that there were police officers involved. And then one of the things that is a buzzword in law enforcement right now is procedural justice, talking about fairness, voice, impartiality, those types of things. Mm -hmm. And that is not a bad thing. Well, right. in that policing plan, it talked about you should, be, as an administrator of a police department, when you look at discipline or investigations or other, other things, you should be doing procedural justice with officers. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's a good thing to do with officers, it's a great thing to do with your public. Agreed, yeah. And so and what, what we don't want to do is have officers think they're getting held to this standard, but then the public, we're going to hold them to this standard. We're going to give them the same benefits we give the public. Yeah, I, I kind of have a man crush right now, the way we're talking about this. I mean, I'm trying not to hug you. It'd be odd, be weird. <laughs> Actually, I guess it's 2017, it wouldn't be so odd, but we'll just continue on. You talk about transparency. I'm a huge believer in this. I know you talk about in your document, transparency with everything law enforcement does. Talk about the reasoning behind that and kind of how that's helped your agency. Uh, I, go ever to the, I go into everything with the philosophy that our people think right, they do right. Not that we're never going to make a mistake, but when you go into it with nothing to hide, then you can be transparent. Yeah. And when we go into it with, if we make a mistake, we're gonna go deal with that mistake. 
that that's fine too and it also builds that legitimacy with your public and so um, I also view um, you know, we work for the people and when they make laws that say we're gonna have open records or sunshine laws whatever you in your right. area you refer to them as I'm a law enforcement officer, so it's not up to me to violate that law. And if and if the public has chosen to make certain records open, we're going to make them open. Yep. And we're going to stand there. And you know, we had an officer-involved shooting. We made it a we have we have a three-day standard. We try to we try to get out the, that video out there and give it to the press. And we stand tall. And if our officers are correct on that, and they have been. I'm standing right there with him, and I'm I'm gonna say this is why we, what our, this is why our officer did what he did, and I I support him. I stand right there with him, and I brag on him because it is. Uh, There's nothing that says you have to wait for the DA to make a decision or for the investigator. To make. You can. That's what frustrated me so much about Ferguson is we let this false narrative go on for months. When that night, Chief, those leaders in that department knew exactly what happened. And they chose to be silent. Yeah, and I think everybody's got to view the situation. But when you know that you, your agency has done right, you put it out there. You know, we had a uh, another shooting in the same year. Uh, we, we went 17 years without a shooting. And then we had two in one year, one fatal and one not fatal. And um, on one of them, we heard criticism from even the other law enforcement officers because they did the very thing that we hate our public doing and that is they didn't have all the information they watched a video clip and they said that That's they right. knew what happened but I was going to stand there with my officer and put that into context and explain what he did and why he did it and uh, and that does nothing but build support from your people when you do That's that right. because again if you love your people you, you stay there with them. Well I love how you did it and the video was actually in the Courageous Leadership Seminar. You actually played the video and you stood there with the video and you gave context to what people were watching and the media had to record both. It wasn't just, here's the download of the video and that's it. You gave actual context and your officers have got to be appreciative of that. Well, and knowing how the, um, it, it's knowing how the media reacts to things and working that through your system. Um, everybody in the media wants to be first. So that means that if they're going to be first, they have to go live. It has to be a live shot. When they show it live, you get to put the context yep. that you want to with it. And I don't mean that we slanted it one way or the other. Just told the facts. We told the truth. Yep. And what it prevented was uh, somebody else coming along, cutting the film to pieces, and then putting their slant on it. And so in those types of situations, I, I truly do believe in having a, uh, a press conference. Speaking of going first, we talked about this off camera. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention it here again today is we're so, you know, traditionally we work with the media and we hope the media spins the right story for us and this and that. Number one, I hate that terminology spin. We just need to give the facts. Correct. But why don't we go first? Why don't we as law enforcement, why don't we put the story out first? Why do we have to rely on the media? In fact, with today's technology, uh, there's no reason why most police departments couldn't be their own news crew, couldn't be their own YouTube channel, couldn't be their own Twitter or Facebook. There is no reason why a police department could not get the video out first and the facts out first. Then the media can come alongside it because we all know what people, we all know what is the fact is, is the first story carries probably the most credibility, true or not. Right. And who knows more about the truth than the actual people involved in the story. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it extends all the way back to setting your standards ahead of time and saying this is what we're going to do. When you do things out of the norm, when you do things that are unexpected, when you say we've had this situation so now we're not going to release a video. Or it's inconsistent. Or, or it's inconsistent. Yeah. Then then you have problems because you're going to be accused of changing the, the setup based on the situation which, Im, which implies guilt. If you say that our officers get to watch video before they make a statement and you do that two years before you have an incident, yeah. it's not that you change the rules, it's that you said that's what you believe. You may have to have a conversation yeah. if that's what you believe in. And I know there's pluses and minuses to both sides. Our agency has, has staked the ground that our officers are going to get to watch the video before they make a statement. And that's because we're out for the truth. We're not out for the gotcha moment. Well, you actually have this in your policing plan about body camera footage that you yes. will let officers watch footage before they make a statement, which somehow has become controversial in this country. Why would we not want officers to refresh their memory, whether it's reports or video, before they give a statement right, that could be held against them? Uh, but there's people out there that, that don't want that, which is mind-boggling to me, which I would say, well, they people would say, well, this. The suspect in a shooting doesn't get to do that. Well, no, I would say that if a suspect records himself shooting somebody, we'd be more than happy to let him watch the video too, right? Well, Which is what police officers do. We're carrying body camera footage around. We have to use force. 
and and it only makes sense to let them watch it. But you have kind of cut that controversy off at the knees because you've said beforehand, this is what we're going to do, and this is why we're doing it. And we made, yeah, we made the point in there that officers, when they are in those situations, they have constitutional rights because you're because you wear a blue uniform and a badge or a tan uniform and a badge that you don't give up your constitutional rights. Right. And we've staked that ground and we've said, we're because they have constitutional rights and they could remain silent if they wanted to. Right. And we're, you know, that gets into Garrity and other things, but for the, for the criminal portion of this, they could remain silent. And so we've said, what we're gonna do is we're gonna encourage their cooperation on the criminal side of things by letting them watch that video because we want the truth and we're gonna go in there. If a defense attorney told you as a police officer that you couldn't interview his client unless he watched the video. So you're gonna get either no, um, no way to interview the person or you get to interview the person. A lot of times we're gonna give that up and we're gonna say, sure, watch the video. Right. Because we're, we're into the truth. But somehow we've allowed the narrative that, that, is, that that's somehow inconsistent right. with, with uh, justice and other things. But if you stake the ground beforehand, we can ask the people later, yeah. if you had a problem with this, why didn't you question it at that point? Because everybody from our council to the citizens to our officers to the administration, everybody has had input on this plan. What, what we're talking about here, and of course uh, it's in our leadership seminar that is sponsoring our show today, is, is a little philosophy called leave no doubt, which means go so far above and beyond when it comes to training, policy, communication, policing plan. Go so far above than what you have to, that if anybody tried to question you, Chief, people would literally think that was silly. If anybody ever questioned, if anybody came back and questioned you two years from now on why you let someone watch footage, you could easily go, did you see this a couple years ago on Lost or Live? You know what right. I mean? It's so far, it would just be asking people, to, but we know that's what happens. You know, there's almost a playbook from what I call the cop haters. I don't want to get that confused with the people that truly want to help us reform. But let's face it, if you're getting called names in the first three seconds of somebody, they don't really want to, they're divisive. They're not wanting to try to help. And of course, we all know those individuals. Uh, but these but these so-called cop haters, it's in a playbook. Let's attack training. Let's attack policy. Let's, let's make them take drug tests. Let's do this. Let's do that. And at some point, you have, at law enforcement, we have to go on the offense. And that's the offense. That's your game plan, right? right? You are saying, this is what we're about. This is what we're going to do. Any questions? And of course, nobody has questions now, right? They only would question it once a critical incident happens, but the ship's already sailed. Right. And, and this plan, what it does is it stakes out what we think is right. And uh, we've got some things that I'm sure some police departments, if you're, it, it can go the other way too. We get a us versus them mentality in law enforcement. Yep. And we say, well, we're gonna stake our ground in that we're not gonna cooperate with investigations or we're gonna make it so hard to fire a bad officer that he can never get fired. If you're staking your ground on the bad things, you're gonna pay a price for that. And especially if you haven't stated that up front. Right. Uh, training, another thing, people get resistant because we don't like change. We don't like to think that somehow if we go to a training that it, it somehow that it implies that we didn't know what we were doing or that uh, we're gonna have to change what we do. What if I propose to you that when we look at training, whether it be de-escalation training, diversity training, anti-bias policing training, uh, any of those things, uh, mental health training, any of those things that the public right now is clamoring that we get, why would we resist that? Because right. we are in the position to go evaluate the training, bring in the best training that there's available, and to put this in terms for police officers that it's going to be on our terms. It's going to be the right thing to do. And there's nothing to be scared of because the other thing you're doing is you're staking the ground that you're not afraid to meet our public halfway in what they're, in what they're wanting. And you know what the worst case scenario is, is you have to go to the training in reaction to some event. Correct. Why not get the training before the event? Correct. Because we know we're in a business where bad things tend to happen, even if we do everything right. And, and how many of these classes are, and, and, and let's use de-escalation training, how many people who are going to de-escalation training have been through CIT training, who have been through verbal Which is mental health training. Which is mental yeah. health training, active listening. Yep. How many people have been through verbal skills training, which is also active listening, yep. and active listening is in de-escalation training. So how many, so, so because we put a new moniker on it, before we put a new name on it, but it's another version of no the one same would, No one would say no to verbal judo. That sounds cool. Right. right? That's nothing more than de-escalation. And that's no more than active listening. That's right. So 
we don't need to be scared of these new Sorry trains. for the trademark violation on that verbal judo thing. You know, get all hensy <laughs> about that. But we, we don't need to be scared of these things because if it gives our pu public more confidence in who we are, that means we face less problems right. on the street. And so this is not pie in the sky things. You know, this is not some uh, mamby pamby, we're getting soft on crime thing. One of the things we put in our, I heard you talking earlier about um, when there's a video, why don't we put that out there? We, do, we don't handle it that way. We don't go out there with the video, but what we did do is we, we staked our ground. We said that we're gonna ask our officers to uh, go out and do the right thing and wear video. And they're now very supportive of this. They've always have been actually. Right. And we, we didn't do this after Ferguson. We've, we've been wearing video for about eight years. And so our officers, we- You were on VCR cameras at one point. Yeah, back and we, we- You got cameras for this big. <laughs> we, we staked our ground in this. And then what we said is, is if the officer's wrong, if he goes out and he abuses a citizen, we're gonna terminate that officer or other discipline, and he may even face criminal sanctions. But if you come in and file a complaint against one of our officers, and it was malicious, there was no truth to it, we are going to file an action against you in municipal court. We passed a, a municipal ordinance that said you can't do that. So it's holding our officers accountable and it's holding the public accountable. And again, this isn't an us versus them thing. Right. This is a standards thing. This is what we believe in. That's good stuff. Now let me talk about one of the more controversial parts of the plan. Not controversial to you or I, but I think some people may see it as that, is when you get involved in an officer-involved shooting in your department, you're gonna have an outside agency investigate that. Talk to us about the thinking behind that. It is just that, it's adding credibility that our agency is not above outside scrutiny, that it's not us going to hide something, that we're going to have another agency come in and we're gonna stand by what our officers do. I go into everything that my guys are 99.999% right. Because, I because they are. Because they are. Yeah. Because the, and when you, when you come into things with that philosophy, I know the quality work they do. I know those things. And this is lawofficer.com. You know, this isn't, I'm, I'm talking to you here as a police officer. Right. I love our people and I love our organization and I believe in what we do. And when you come at it with that philosophy, mm -hmm. then you, you can go into it with the faith that your people were right. I tend to believe that facts are facts, right. whether your department investigates it or a state investigation investigates it. Facts are facts and facts don't change and the same conclusion is going to happen. And I think we do a pretty poor job telling the public exactly who we are. You, it's your police department, you are recruiting the best of the best this country has to offer. And I mean, it, th these are men and women with no criminal backgrounds, good people, educated people that just want to do good. To the to their to the people around them, it's you know. So the fact that there's all this scrutiny, why not let someone else investigate it? And think about this: uh, here in Oklahoma, most agencies outside of the two major cities we have, or three or four major cities we have, outside of that, most agencies already had OSBI conduct their their investigation. Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation. Correct. Okay. Most of them already had did that. I called OSBI and I said, we want to enter into an MOU with you and set the ground rules for how this would be conducted just so everybody knew. And they said, that's a wonderful idea. Then the news came out, Sand Springs is the first agency in the state of Oklahoma to do this. What does that really get back to? It gets back to we do a terrible job in mm -hmm. law enforcement at yeah, telling right. people the good things we do. We already had other agencies that already did this. That's right. But they did a terrible job telling people what they're going to do. We did it through an MOU, and all of a sudden, it's look at what Sand Springs did. Yeah, you're a genius. It, 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 we're, not re, we're not reinventing the wheel. I go back to we need to be our own news source. Quit relying on people just automatically thinking you're great. Be your own news source. Tell your own story because there's some awesome stories out there. Right. I want to end with this because I love this part of your document. Of course, I want to encourage our audience to go read this document. I think this document, I'm not just saying this because you're here, Chief. This is a model document for law enforcement around the country that they need. It's model. It, I mean, you can't copy and paste it, but you just about can. I love every bit of this document. And, of course, we get accused here at lawofficer.com, oh, you're too pro-police, and oh, you're this, you're biased, you're this. No, no, we want the most professional police that the world has to offer. That's what our goal is here, whether it's training, facts, information, articles, great interviews, great insight, great information. We want to provide information to make police departments all across our country, all 18,000 plus of them, to be the most professional they can. And this document, whether you're the smallest department in the country or the largest department in the country, 
this document, I believe, is a model for everyone to follow. So let me encourage everyone to go to our website, lawstar.com, check this document out and take a look at it. I think it's going to fit almost everything they do, but I want to end with this because this is a great part of this document. You talk about empowering your employees. I love that philosophy. Talk to us about that. Your employees will surprise you and amaze you with their ingenuity, with their professionalism, and with what they do. My guys surprise me every day I'm at work. And if you believe in your employees, you empower them, and I make them part of that process, and I'm along for the ride. That doesn't mean that the buck doesn't stop with me. Right. That doesn't mean that I'm not ultimately accountable, and that doesn't mean that all the time I go with, the, uh, with their requests. Sometimes you have to be the boss. Right. But these, if you can give people a gun, a badge, and a car and tell them to go out and fight crime, I think you can probably involve them with decisions like what days off are going to be and what our schedule is going to be and what color uniform we're going to wear and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they have time and time and time again just elevated my expectations because they always do right. The smartest people we have are our people. Yes, and I think the smartest people on earth sometimes are, pol are police officers. No question about because it. Because we have to be as good as attorneys, and we have to be as good as social workers, and we have to be as good as everybody else in America, and we're in that fishbowl. People are constantly watching us, and so cops are just the, the greatest. And as Paul Harvey would say, and you got to be able to live on a policeman's salary. There you go. Uh, listen, uh, we, we, we do a lot here at Lawson.com. We talk a lot about bad leadership, cowardly leadership. Uh, we also talk about courageous leadership, and we've been honored today, Chief, that you are a courageous leader. You're one of a few. We have confidence that through the seminars and through interviews like this that we can inspire a generation of law enforcement officers to become courageous leaders, no matter what the rank, because that is the future of law enforcement. And these philosophies you're talking about today, your policing plan, that's where we start, and I think that's where we end. We can't thank you enough for being with us today. Appreciate you. You've been watching Law Officer Live. And as we've done for several weeks now, is we have the exclusive rights to the WinX 2017 videos. And this week's video is by Richard Martin, and it's on leadership. It's an excellent video. We're very honored to be able to play these for you. We're going to end the episode with you today with Richard. Thank you very much for being with us. daily drop of corrosion on your soul. That's how former LAPD detective turned book author Joseph Wamba explained the daily grind of police work. Now we know that policing is inherently a dangerous profession and we know that you typically tend to make your living in kind of the worst of conditions. So I wanted to spend a second to talk about why people come into the profession of policing to get an understanding. So James Van Oosting, a researcher, came up with two different approaches to life choices. He said there's the professional and there's the vocational. The root of the word vocation comes from the Latin vocare, which means to be called. Now, for those of you old enough to remember, the US Navy used to advertise that theirs wasn't just a job, it was an adventure. Well, I think we could, be, we could say of law enforcement that it's not just a job, it's a calling. In fact, 85% of officers surveyed in a particular study considered the job to be a higher calling rather than just an occupation. And one definition of vocation that I particularly like refers to it as an approach to a particular life role that's oriented towards deriving or, or, or demonstrating your life's purpose. So spirituality as a concept has never been definitively defined by researchers. But all of the researchers tend to agree that spirituality, the main component of spirituality, is purpose or meaning in life. So, Carrie Friedman, the author of Spiritual Survival for Law Enforcement, he tells us that the, the primary component, or the, the primary um, reason for spirituality or the, the goal of any kind of system of spirituality 
is to infuse one's life with transcendent value and meaning. Now, let me differentiate here and, and clarify that when I talk about spirituality, I'm not talking about religion. Religion can be a form that spirituality may take or can take, but spirituality would be the, the source behind that form. And spirituality is a very uh, personal and individual endeavor. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. So, Kerry Friedman notes that the reasons that people come into the profession of law enforcement are both noble and spiritual. In fact, he states that there can be no more noble or spiritual aspiration than to serve and protect. And I kind of agree with him on that. So we can say that, uh, that law enforcement is a spiritual, spiritual calling. The caution that Van Osting tells us is that adhering to a life calling actually brings with it, uh, leads to a life of what he calls a life of sacrifice. And all too often I think that the new officers coming into the profession aren't adequately prepared to deal with those sacrifices that they're asked to make. And you all know the sacrifices we're talking about. In fact, Van Osting goes on to say that continued adherence to one's calling can lead to what he calls a world of darkness. So officers, when they first hit the streets, the reality of the profession clashes with their expectations of what the profession is. And they realize that it's no longer about swooping in and being the hero of the day. Um, rather, it's more about confrontation and crisis, that there are going to be people that will hate them for no particular reason. They, very quickly, they, become, they come to feel unappreciated by the very people that they're serving and protecting and risking their lives for every day. And they're ostracized and even mentally and physically abused. So what happens is they tend to pull away. And they'll pull away from some of those supports that they had come to rely on through their lives. And things such as organized religion, they start losing faith in because they start, they start distrusting the people in the institutions, or they lose faith in those people and institutions that they used to trust. So they end up pulling away, and they might even pull away from loved ones. Some will pull away completely into what is referred to as a state of spiritual isolation, where they'll kind of isolate themselves from all of society. And some will just isolate themselves from anybody that's not another cop. And that might sound familiar to some of us in the room. Right? We might call church call, choir practice, debriefing sessions after work, right? So Friedman uses the analogy of a bank account to illustrate spirituality as a, in a police officer. And he says that we come into, every person that comes into law enforcement comes in with a certain level of hope and faith and that every time the police officer encounters evil or suffering, they make a withdrawal from that bank account. And that over time, if the officer doesn't intentionally make deposits back into that account, it becomes depleted and overdrawn into what Friedman refers to as a state of spiritual bankruptcy. And this is where those reservoirs of um, idealism and passion and energy are drying up, or have dried up. So when this happens, and, and the officers enter this state of spiritual bankruptcy, it brings with it a level of pain. And as human beings, what do we tend to do when we experience pain? We'll take something to alleviate that pain, right? So perhaps that might be part of the reason for those church calls and choir practices after work, right? We might anesthetize, try to temporarily anesthetize that pain with some kind of a substance, whether it's alcohol or maybe even something more harsh. But we know that over time, if the pain isn't dealt with effectively, it grows into despair. And eventually, despair becomes hopelessness. 
Viktor Frankl, a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps in World War II, observed that the one factor that seemed to differentiate between those that survived the camps and those that died was hope. He noted that those with just the smallest sliver of hope seemed to have enough to survive, while those that didn't have any hope died. So if we look at the numbers in law enforcement, in 2009, 400 police officers took their own lives. That's more than the combined total of officers killed in the line of duty in 2012, 2013, and 2014 combined. Some research tells us that police officers are eight times more likely to take their own life than to, be, than to, than to die at the hands of someone else. So if that statistic isn't startling enough, consider this. In one study, 98, let me repeat that, 98% of the officers that were surveyed in this study admitted of contemplating taking their own life at some point during their career. That hits me in the heart. But what that also does is it paints a picture for us. It paints a picture of depleted spirituality or what we might more commonly refer to as burnout. So, burnout isn't what we might tend to think of when we use the term, right? When we tell our coworkers or our loved ones that you know, I feel so burnt out at work, okay? We all get run down and tired and we can kind of, once we get a chance to take a break and we can step back and rejuvenate, right? Burnout goes beyond that. Burnout is a prolonged, a prolonged um, thing um, that results from chronic stress. Now, policing is, a, is an inherently stressful profession. In 2015, it was ranked the fifth most stressful profession in the United States, and that was up from ninth just the year prior. So they reached that, that uh, rating based on several factors, factors like um, uh, physical exertion at work, interaction with the public, um, encountering hazards, threat to your own life or threat to somebody else's. I mean, heck, they might as well have just defined policing with that, right? Because it fits all those categories. Well, those are all factors that we would label as uh, operational stress factors. But there's a, a whole other realm of stress factors out there, and they're called organizational stress factors. Research dating back to 1974 and several times since then has found that the organizational factors contribute more to the stress of the police officer than the operational factors do. Things like the authoritative or authoritarian um, management model, the internal disciplinary practices, those things that tend to influence the perception of, organization, of the, the officer's perception of organizational justice in the agency. So these, those things have been found to actually create more stress for the officer. Now, historically, police agencies have been uh, structured in a, in a mechanistic mili uh, type of st uh, structure where power's kind of concentrated at the top of the organization, mandates come down, and officers are, are expected to implement those mandates. And leaders tend to focus on controlling the, the behaviors of their subordinates through policies and procedures, rules and regulations, and threat of discipline. And I'm sure that probably sounds familiar to some people in this room. The problem with that is that that very structure has been found to create in the leaders a, a perception of people as resources to be used. And anybody that's familiar with the work of Immanuel Kant and his categorical imperative knows that that's actually a form of unethical behavior. And that the specific leadership style related to that is actually dehumanizing. So what we're doing is we're actually exacerbating the problem oftentimes, that we're taking those factors that are actually within our control in policing and we're not adhering to best practices and we're actually adding to the stress levels of the police officer. So, as I said, burnout is not just that tired feeling, it goes beyond that. But spirituality can be a way to protect 
the officers from burnout because stress has actually been found to be related to spirituality. So over time, stress has been found to actually change the, change the brain physiologically. It becomes a part of the functioning of the brain. And while that involves the communication between neurons and synapses and all those things that I don't understand, and maybe you will, but what I can understand is that the research says, the medical research says that it actually negatively affects officers' abilities to make complex decisions, and it's those complex decisions that they're going to be expected to make every day. But with, with spiritual health and maintaining the spiritual welfare of the, of the police officer, it, it can actually work to change the negative effects of this chronic toxic exposure in policing and actually enhance officers' resilience to stress. Now, why we don't focus more on spirituality and policing is actually amazing to me because in 1991, there was actually testimony in front of the U.S. House of Representatives where the spiritual health of the police officer was considered a top priority. However, fast forward 18 years later, in 2009, it looked like it was finally starting to gain some traction. In fact, the FBI Law Enforcement Bulletin dedicated an entire issue to the topic of police spirituality. But the very next year, one researcher would observe that even after all that time, spirituality is often the most neglected and contentious aspect of law enforcement. So it's incumbent upon leaders to find ways to, um, to work to protect the spirituality of the police officer. If nothing else, you're going to protect that police officer from the three components of burnout. So emotional exhaustion being the first component, depersonalization or dehumanization being the second component, and diminished personal accomplishment. Now, as a, any kind of a law enforcement leader or a leader of any organization, those three things should be of critical importance, right? Think about the, the outcome of an officer who was emotionally exhausted and has dehumanized the very people that they're attempting to police and protect, serve and protect. And you could actually think back to maybe some instances of excessive uses of force and maybe offer that as an explanation about what prompted the officer to, to use excessive force. So I'll, I'll leave you with this. In last year's WinX conference, retired Marine Corps Colonel uh, Richard Coleman kind of gave a mandate to the crowd there. And he asked that we get back to the spirit of our, of our vocational calling and understand our purpose as law enforcement. And I thought that was pretty power, powerful. And I will kind of reiterate Colonel Coleman's call, particularly to the leaders in law enforcement, to start focusing on the spiritual welfare of their officers in the department to enhance not only the health of the, of the officer, but enhance their overall performance for the agency so that they can continue to serve and protect in their highest capacity and maintain a high standard of living beyond going home. You heard one of my colleagues earlier today talk about what happens when you get home. Well, let's take care of these officers so that when they do get home, they have that high level of, of standard of living, that they maintain the quality of their personal relationships, that they don't isolate themselves from the rest of society and their loved ones, and can actually help to continue to contribute to moving their communities forward and the profession of law enforcement forward much like the, the mentoring that Jonathan talked about early today. So I would ask that that calling be, uh, that be what I leave to you today and think about how we can address um, the spiritual aspect of policing to enhance their lives and the profession of policing overall. Thank you.